Hi guys, so welcome to Class of Asymptotes channel where we do everything accounting science. My name is Garabo Sitole and in today's video we are doing close cooperation. If you haven't subscribed, please make sure you click that subscribe button. So without wasting time, let's get right into today's content. So we said close cooperation. So close cooperation is a form of ownership. You are going to have your private companies, you're going to have your partnerships, sole traders, private companies, public companies um etc right and close cooperation is a form of ownership right so this is a form of ownership form of ownership it's in it's it's the form in which you own this entity right so it is regulated by the close cooperation act 69 15. so the reason why i say 15 is because it might be hard for you to remember 1984. So all you're going to say is 69 plus 15, and then you're going to get that it's um, that of 84, right? So it's the Close Cooperation Act of 69, 1984, but I just call it the Act of 6915. That way I can just add the 15 on the 69, and then I'm fine. So this Act introduced a cheaper way or cheaper option for small businesses, right, to have a combination of a partnership as well as a company. So we are saying instead of small businesses just sticking to um, having their form of ownership as a partnership or a sole trader, we want to allow them, right, to have some of the benefits of a company. Those benefits are things like perpetual succession. We want them to have limited liability. We want them to right have legal personality etc but at the same time we still want them to have some partnership relationship with their members right so this act actually came into place for small businesses in order to allow them to still remain as partners but at the same time have that in a regulated um manner have some regulation some acts right that are going to regulate how that is done right so you're going to have a combination of a partnership and a company right so this allowed micro and entities meaning small businesses to enjoy perpetual succession as i said legal personality affordable regulation to abide to right while remaining partners right while remaining members in a partnership we call those partners members right so as the act of 69 of 19 84 was made for small companies so this act was made for small entities not for big entities and to be able to kind of have a structure of how that is gonna play out they made sure that a cc members are limited only to 10 so it can only have a members between 1 to 10 one of the first characteristic of cc is that they can have members between 1 to 10 so not more than that Right. So under the new companies Act of 2008, new CCs cannot be formed. Right. But those that were inexistent before the effective date of the companies Act can still continue to exist. And then you might ask yourself, when was this effective date of the companies Act? Because the companies Act is that of 2008, but its effective date is actually the 11th of May 2011. So any close cooperations that came into existence um, before the 11th of May 2011 can continue to exist and no new CCs can then be formed after the 11th of May 2011, right? So how do these close cooperations acquire legal personality and how do they have those characteristics of the company, some of those characteristics of the company, right? So they acquire, meaning they get, they um, get um, legal personality upon the registration of its founding statement. So when they say founding statement, they are basically saying the MOI, but this time around, rem the MOI, remember, is a registration document for companies. So we are saying instead of an o uh, instead of an MOI for companies, for close corporations, we're going to call it a founding statement. So this founding statement, once it is registered, right, with the CIPC, um the close cooperation is gonna acquire legal personality right i'm not sure if the cipc was inexistent before the companies act but yeah don't say cipc if you're not sure just say um as soon as they have registered this founding statement then they acquire the legal personality right so what is the founding statement it is the registration document for sec just like how the moi is a registration document for your companies the founding statement is the moi for ccs right and as I said, a CC cannot have more than 10 people 
And another important thing is that a juristic person cannot be a member. When we say a juristic person, we are saying other companies, other chess, okay, other companies, um, another company, another public company, another partnership. So another jurist partnership is not a juristic person, Karabu. Okay, other companies, right? Guys, you know what I mean by juristic person, another company, not a natural person. So other juristic persons cannot become members of a CC. So you can't have some company ABC being a member of a CC, but you can have a CC being a shareholder in another company, right? And another important thing with a CC is that a member's interest cannot be held jointly, right? So if you think of people that are married, right, um, in community of property, we are saying that they, whatever you have, whatever is yours is mine, right? Um, but in terms of CCs, if one of the spouses, right, is a member of a CC, their member's interest is theirs. It's not jointly held by this person and their partner. So if the partner wants to claim rights on that member's interest, it needs to be realized, meaning it needs to be sold and then they share the profits. But then there's never going to be a time where you jointly hold on to your member's interest. So it's only going to be held by that one person, not jointly. Right? And if you want to claim from that because you have the right to then it needs to be realized means meaning sold and then you cut it in half and then you share the profit right okay and then let us look at the formation of the cc right so we look at the formation of the cc so under the new companies act no new ccs can be formed i will keep on saying that because it is important in existence ccs prior to the effective date of the new companies act which is on the 11th of may 2011 can continue to exist and they can, those that um, were in existence before, they can still amend their founding statement. So just because no new CCs can be formed doesn't mean that whatever founding statement you had before the New Companies Act can't now be amended. If you were in existence before the Companies Act came into play, right, meaning you have a CC, then you can still, even after it became effective, still amend, right, make changes to your founding statement. So we're busy talking about this founding statement, but what exactly does it include? I list some of the things. This list is not um, full, but some of the things that might be easy for you to remember in a test or an exam. So the first name is that obviously it needs to list the full name of the business and any acceptable abbreviations, right? So if they want to call themselves ABC, right, to stand, they want... Um, their names to be abbreviated by ABC, then that needs to be in their founding statement, right? Um, and then needs to tell us about the principal business. So you can have, they can have subsidiary businesses, right? But we need to know their principal business, right? And that needs to be in their founding statement. Um, in the founding statement, there should be information about the number of members, so how many members you have, and the aggregate of the members in members contribution right so how much did people contribute in order to get the members interest when we say members interest it's basically kind of equal to a share when you talk about a company so in companies the shareholders hold a share in a cc the members hold a member's interest and how would they acquire that member's interest by contributing um in this cc so we are saying we want to know how much did they contribute how much did they pay Right. We want to know their year end dates. We want to know their address and we want to know each member's interest. Another important thing about this thing of the member's interest is that it needs to be in percentage form and it needs to be an aggregate of 100 percent. So you can't have a member's interest that's 80 percent. No, the member's interest percentage needs to be shared amongst all the members based on their contribution. And when you add it together, it needs to be 100 percent, not above, not below. Right. So let's talk in depth about this member's interest. Right. So as I said, uh, member's interest is kind of equal to a share that shareholders hold in a company. But in a CC, the members hold a member's interest. Right. So it should be expressed as a percentage. It may not be jointly held, as I said, and the aggregate of this member's interest for the CC must be equal to 100 percent. Right. And as I said, the interest in a CC, the interest of a member in a CC is equal to that of a shareholder in a company 
right so what is a member's interest a member's interest is the ra is their right to profits after creditors have been paid so this member's interest entitles rights the members to share in the cc's profit as soon as you have paid all your creditors right so that's what a member's interest is just think of shares if you are a bit confused right so members interest may be acquired by so how can you acquire them i already told you guys this they can be um or well, i haven't they can be acquired from existing members so you can buy the members interest from other members in the cc or you can get this by making a contribution to the cc so i did um talk about that point right so you have acquired this um this cc remember the principle of what we are talking about is still the act itself so act 6915 so that's still the act so if you were still discussing this it would still be under the act you haven't touched the, the section the sections yet right so how then do you dispose of a member's interest now that we are talking about the disposal of a member's interest we start to get into sections and these sections actually start at section 34 right the important one step is section 34. so the cc's act right says that disposal can only be made in accordance with the far with the association document or with the consent of all members right so in any normal disposal of interest you need to have the consent of all members which makes sense because a cc is only for 10 members and if let's say for instance a member that has 70 percent of the interest wants to sell it it's gonna affect everybody else so all the members need to consent to you actually selling that member's interest right or how you dispose of it should um be based on what the association document says so the association document is basically an internal document it doesn't need to be filed it tells us the rights and the duties of the members it tell it gives guidance on such things on how are you going to dispose of a member's interest what are the procedures that you as a cc want to follow when someone wants to become a new member etc those type of things that make it easier to um, run the cc right it's an internal document so you can dispose of it based on what this association document said or with the consent of all members right this and these two there are two cases in which the company's act gives us guidance on so this is like um a basic principle that you need to have the consent of all members and you need to dispose of that member's interest based on what the association association document says however there are two specific cases in which guidance is given on and now we start to look at section references right so let me just refresh your memory um insider trading we said it starts at 77 it defines at 77 and then we went on to business rescue it starts at 128 now we are on close cooperation and we're saying it starts at section 34 right so disposal is where it starts right the section references so there are two cases the first case is when a member is insolvent and that is guided by section 34 the second case is when the member is dead so they don't just want to dispose of this member's interest but this um so there's this case of insolvency that makes them want to dispose of that member's interest or they're not just selling it because it's fun right this member is dead that's why we want to sell their members interest so those are the two cases that we are given guidance on and for the dead member it's under section 35 right so for insolvent people or for an insolvent member meaning when you're insolvent it means your liabilities are greater than your assets so um for an insolvent member the trustee right the person responsible remember when you are insolvent you no longer um make decisions right the court is gonna give you someone who's gonna carry out your transactions for you take decisions for you to try and like save you right so the trustee in this case may realize the member's interest right by so when you are insolvent you want to pay your creditors you're not able to pay your creditors so we are saying in order to pay those creditors this insolvent person is going to have to sell their members interest rights and how can it then be realized realized mean means how then can we sell it and get money from it um the cases this the cases are the same of how you're going to do it for the insolvent person and the dead person so i'm going to also cover for the dead person for the dead member it may be transferred to whoever they listed on their will right and if this is not permitted the interest can be realized by right so for both the insolvent and the dead person the 
um, interest can be realized by selling the in the member's interest to the CC. So you can get money um, of the member's interest, dispose of the member's interest by selling it to the CC. Secondly, by selling it to other members or by selling it to a third party preemptive, right, to the CC as well as the members not taking it. By preemptive, we are saying you can't start by selling it to the third party. You need to first sell it to the CC and its members. And if only and only if the CC and its members do not want to buy the member's interest, are you then allowed to sell it to a third party? All right. So those are the three cases um, for insolvent people as well as dead people. And they are governed by Section 34, Section 35. Right. So for insolvent people or for the insolvent member, the amount is paid to the creditors. And for the dead person, the amount is paid to whoever was on their will. All right. And then Section 34, Cap Ace, allows for a member's interest to be sold to a CC, its members, or third party as required by a legal judgment. So we are saying, okay, you can sell for an insolvent person, you can sell for a dead person, but what if there was a legal judgment, right, that needed you to settle some amount that you were owing um, and you were using your member's interest for that? Then that is guided by Section 34, Cap A. And if you think of Section 34, it's talking about insolvent people. People are not able to pay their debts. We are talking about debts. So Section Section Cap A is also still talking about paying some debts, right? And this is due to a legal judgment. So it's Section 34, Cap A, legal judgments, right? Now, what are the duties that these members owe to the CC, right? So the duties that these members owe are similar to those that... Um, directors owe to a company right the first there are two of those um they owe a fiduciary duty right and this is under section 42 we started at section 34 35 now we are jumping to 42 right so a fiduciary duty and then um it's they owe this duty of care and skill and this is under section 43 right so let's look at these duties in depth fiduciary duty under section 42 states that you need to act in honest you need to act honestly and in good faith, right? So you need to be honest and act in good faith. How can you do this? By exercising your powers in the best interest of the CC and not above your powers, right? So you can um, carry out your fiduciary duty by acting in honesty and in good faith by acting in the best, by exercising your power to act in the best interest of the CC and by not acting above your power. Right. Secondly, by avoiding conflicts of interest. So you have the fiduciary duty to avoid conflicts of interest by not deriving any personal gain to which they are not entitled to you. And you would have received that gain by virtue of the CC. All right. Um, secondly, um, you have the fiduciary duty to not disclose any material um, interest. Right. You can't disclose any material um information to others etc right and you must not compete with the cc in its business activity so you cannot be a competitor to the cc right now contracts concluded between members and ccs so members must disclose any material interest in contracts right and if we just look at this this is based on right the fiduciary duty to avoid conflicts of interest and we are saying if the entity is going to get into some contracts with someone and you as a member has some material interest in that contract right it might be your family member so you have material interest significant interest right then we are saying you need to disclose to the members right and if you don't disclose then you become personally liable and the, that contract is going to be voidable and the CC can then decide whether to continue with the contracts or not continue with the contracts. I'm going to emphasize again, voidable means you can still ratify. You can still make it valid. Void means you cannot make it valid. So if you think back to business rescue, where we talked about, um, where we talked about if you don't inform affected persons within five days, then the business rescue proceedings become void and null, null and void. It means you cannot now fix them. You need to reapply after three months. Here we are saying if a member does not disclose of any material interest, then that contract to which they have a material interest becomes voidable, meaning the CC can now, you know, ratify that and fix it. Right. Um, so the member will be held personally liable for any losses that are made in this contract unless they disclose or they have approval of other members right, to just continue with the contract. The second um, 
duty that these members owe to the CC is the duty of care and skill, and this is under Section 43, right? Section 42, fiduciary duty. Section 43, duty of care and skill. So the member's conduct is then compared to what a reasonable person would do with the same skill, right? So we are saying in order to assess whether you dealt with the transaction of the entity with care, we're going to now test what a reasonable person would have done if they were in your shoes and if they had the same skill as yours and you also have the fiduciary you have the duty sorry you have the duty to ensure that you upskill you have the duty to ensure that you don't act above your powers um in terms of skill so if you know that you do not if you know let's say the cc has to do with some um lab tests right and you just have financial knowledge and then you now conclude a contract that is um, based on what is done in the lab then you have breached your um your duty of care and skill because you acted above what your skill allowed you to so as a member of the cc you need to make sure that you do not act above your powers right what then do we do if these members breach right and this is governed by section um 36 right so there are different um types of remedies right the section 36 and the section 49 so the first section is where it is lodged against a member by a member so we are saying a member is going to be a representative of the cc applied to the courts to have a member's interest taken away from them right so it's the cessation of a member's interest by a court order and this is under section 36 in the section 49 says that if a member is unhappy with what the cc did right um preju if it's prejudicial right then they can also apply to the courts to have whatever prejudicial act that was done on them be lifted right so there are two of those remedies the first one member can apply to the court to have the member removed and that member that is applying on behalf of the cc needs to prove that the member is unable to perform the member would have prejudicial effects in carrying in carrying on with the business sorry with the spelling the member made it reasonably impossible for other members to continue associating with him or her maybe the member is involved in a rape case etc and that member is then making it impossible for the cc to continue associating themselves with that or the member maybe is involved in a corruption case those kind of cases right and the member feels right that it is or the member thinks that it is just and equitable to do so so they need to prove to the court that the member is unable to perform their duties the member will have prejudicial prejudicial effects in carrying on with the business the member made it reasonably impossible for other members to continue associating with him or her or it is just and no not or and it is just inequitable to do so right we're almost done and then i talked about section 49 this is where the member feels like there was prejudicial conduct right against them so they are lodging a complaint against the cc with the courts right and the courts may then give an order for such prejudicial action to be stopped or for the founding and association document to be amended etc right so those are the two um remedies first of all you can have you can apply to the court to have the member's interest taken away from them and you need to prove those grounds that we talked about this is under section 36 now we are saying the member can also apply to the court against the cc this is under section 49 right and then acquisition of members interest by the cc so a cc may buy another member's interest given that all members consent the cc will have another member after they have disposed of that member of the member they want to dispose of and the member's interest will still remain at 100%. So meaning they're going to buy that uh, member's interest and maybe distribute it amongst the other members or it is bought by someone else, right? Bought by the CC. So the CC, remember that the CC is their own person, right? They have legal personality, so they can also own some form of member's interest, right? So the CC must be solvent. In order to be able to buy something, they need to be solvent after the payment meaning their assets must be greater than their liabilities after the payment right so i talked about the association document and guidance on this is given on section 44 we said it's an internal document does not need to be filed but it is binding on all the members and it gives the rights and responsibilities of members and it gives on guidance on how to dispose of members interest um and the likes 
right? And representation of a CC, section 54. So section 54 states that all members act as agents of the CC, even if the other members do not know. Right. So section 54 is very important. It says that even if other members did not know that you are going to conclude on this um, on this deal, that contract is valid. Right. Because you as a member, you act as an agent of the CC, considering that any contract was done in the name of the CC. So you did state the name in that contract as well as the, the word CC at the end. Then that contract becomes binding, even if the other members did not know. And then if we look at payments by CCs to members, so section 51 gives us guidance on this. So the CC must first meet the liquidity and solvency test before it can make payments to members. So before a CC can pay the members, it needs to first meet the liquidity and solvency test. Unless if the payment is made to the member in the member's capacity as a creditor. So it's saying if you're making normal payments to members, for example, distributions, right? Or, or sharing profits then before you can share the profits to the members you need to make sure that you are liquid right meaning you have cash in the entity and you must be solvent meaning your assets must be greater than your liabilities before you can make those payments unless if you are making the payment to the cc as a creditor so if the cc if the member borrowed you money right and you are paying them you don't they you don't need to meet the liquidation and solvency test before you can pay them because they are a creditor to you they are not acting within their power as a member but within their power as a creditor right what about if um the cc wants to make a loan um to its members under section 52 we are told that this is prohibited right so the cc may not give a loan to its members to any of its members to any cooperation to which the member owns 50 percent or more of interest to a company in which the member is controlled in which a member controls that company right without the written consent of all its members so if it wants to give a loan to this to a member to a corporation in which the member holds 50 percent or more of interest or to a company to which one of its members is controlling then it needs to be done with the written consent of all its members if not it is not allowed it is prohibited and this is under section 52 as we said section 51 payments so 50 is talking about payments section 51 payments to cc section section 52 loans to members right etc and then we are almost done guys and then if we were to just look at the accounting officer accounting officer is under section 58 right of close cooperation act and some guidance of this is given under section 30 of the company's act so an accounting officer must be appointed by the cc right to make the financial statements to report on them and to report on any irregularities um, for example, if there's some fraud occurring in the entity, then they need to inform the other members, right? And they also need to report on whether the entity is insolvent or solvent, right? So the CC statements need not be audited, right? But the company's acts may require some CC statements to be audited um, while considering their public score, right? And if their public score interest is high, then some of the CCs will need to be audited as per the new company's act. And then personal liability for CCs debts, right? So section 65 allows that the corporate veil be pierced in cases of gross abuse, right? So section 65 of the CC Act allows that the corporate veil may be lifted in cases of gross abuse right and then section 20 of the company's act allows that if i don't know how to spell this name but if this type of abuse occurs the cc may be deemed not a juristic person anymore right and lastly what are the advantages and disadvantages of a cc advantages it is easy to form there is limited liability meaning the members um, personal assets will not be affected if the CC cannot pay its debts. And then there's perpetual succession, meaning if one of the members die, the CC will still continue to exist. Disadvantages, no new CCs can be formed. Um, the CCs are subject to the CCs Act as well as some of the provisions in the new companies Act. So more legislation for them to abide with, right? Um, and then the members' interests are limited to 10. And another thing, another disadvantage is that a juristic person may not be a member of the CC. If you haven't subscribed, please make sure you click that subscribe button. Bye, guys.